state of the local economy in Jerusalem. Um, all of the people had gotten busy and sacrificially served to build this wall. Uh, people that lived outside of the city in, in the uh, Judea, uh, Judean hillsides, they moved inside of the city both for safety and security, but also that their presence would be uh, more accessible to the building work that was going on there. And then uh, it wasn't all of a sudden by any means, but it was it became very visible that, uh-oh, there's a need here. Um, we've donated our time and our effort and our energy to the Lord's work, and we've gotten behind Nehemiah, but now, uh, you know, we're taking up corn to feed our families. We're trying to, we're, we're trying to just make ends meet here. And then on top of that, there began to be reports that were given to Nehemiah uh, about things that had happened before Nehemiah ever showed up that had taken advantage of Jewish people. And here's the saddest thing about it. These things weren't done by the unbelieving godless Gentiles. The, the ones that had taken advantage were the Jewish people that should have known better. And we talked about this last Sunday night, but if they had just followed God's word, they would have been in a lot better position. Um, but they had neglected God's word. They had neglected what God said and how God told them to... to uh, Live And so there were some we found out that had mortgaged their lands, their vineyards, their houses, that they could buy food for their families to eat. There were uh, some that had borrowed money for the king's tribute, and now they were behind in debt, behind on their payments, and uh, their children and things like that were being uh, taken advantage of as far as in, in the labor force there because of the debt of the people. And so Nehemiah hears all of this, and in verse number 6, uh, I'll ask you to take up with me here. I'll read out loud, and you can follow along. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible says, this is Nehemiah, he says, And I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles. Now, I love it. Uh, Brother Zach and I get to talk about this quite often but I love it when there is a New Testament passage that is so clear, but then that New Testament passage is so clearly illustrated with an Old Testament example. Some of you might already know where I'm going here, but there's a passage in James that says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, what James is talking about there is that in any matter that comes to our attention, we need to be very quick to listen to the matter. Now, you say, well, that's kind of easy. I mean, uh, you know, how do you know the matter unless you listen to it? Well, you tell me. How many times have you started making conclusions before you ever fully heard what was going on? That can be a human trait, can it be? Uh, that, that, can, that can happen sometimes. And so James says, all right, first we're going to hear the matter out. We're going to try to hear it in all of its conclusion. And then we're not going to speak yet. Some people are very, very quick to retort and debate and come back with a very quick answer. But we need to let that sit for a while we need to think on the situation for a while. And if I could just encourage you in this tonight, most problems that you're trying to fix, those problems didn't come about overnight and they're not going to be fixed overnight. So for us to take a little bit of time to prayerfully consider what we've heard is not going to hurt the situation. It's usually not going to hurt the situation as much as a rash response is going to hurt the situation. So we need to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and then slow to wrath. In other words, slow to come to judgment about what needs to be done in the situation. So here we have the people. There's a great cry of the people that comes to Nehemiah, and he hears them out. We don't have any indication that he has any answers yet. He just hears the matter that, that is repeatedly brought before him. 
And the Bible says that he was very angry when he heard their cry and these words. Now, this is an inward emotional response. It is an inward emotional response. Now, God created us to be people of emotion. Um, some have more than others. I've met a few people in this life, I didn't think they knew what emotion was. Just seems like nothing ever stirs them. And I mean, they're just as flat lined as, as can be. Uh, in, in our family, we joke about it a little bit, but I, I, I've got a brother in law. He, he just seems devoid of emotion uh, whatsoever. But that's okay because he married my sister who has more emotion than any 100 people on the planet. And so it, it balances each other out. She needed, she needed a rock to anchor her wayward vessel. I'm just telling you right now. And she got it too. She got it. And, and so there's, there's different levels of emotion that people operate with, but all of humanity has emotion. Can I, can I tell you, Jesus Christ was a man of emotion. And when he went into the temple and saw that his father's house, which God meant to be a house of prayer, had been turned into a den of thieves, guess what? Jesus experienced emotion about that. Furthermore, he was angry about that. Did you know our Bible tells us to be angry and sin not? Which means that anger, the emotion of anger itself, is not a sin. There are things that God gets angry about. There are things that are okay for us to get angry about. But let me tell you something. Anger might be a, a helpful emotion in the human experience, but it is a horrible master. And when you are a slave to anger, then you're not in a good place. You're not in a God-honoring position. And while, while the emotion of anger is not a bad thing and we do well to be angry uh, about some things uh, every now and again, we need to know what to do with that anger and how to process that anger and how to keep our response in a, in a Christ-like way. And so uh, uh, he hears this and he's angry about this. Now we're going to find out as, he, as, as Nehemiah starts to speak, we're going to find out why he's so angry about what's going on. But you can imagine this from what we already know about Nehemiah and what we've already studied in the first four chapters of the book of Nehemiah. We know that Nehemiah is a man who cares very deeply about the character and the testimony of God. That's why he's in Jerusalem. Was because when he heard word that the city lay, was laid waste and that the name of God was reproached because of it, Nehemiah said, God, somebody's got to do something about this and I'm willing to be used if you want me to be God because God cared, I'm sorry, Nehemiah cared about God's reputation and his name not being a reproach or being, being reproached by the people who didn't know God. And so he cares about that. And so he's now looking on a situation where outside the city walls, there are these people that want to do harm to the Jewish people that have returned from captivity. But one, one thing that makes him very angry is that he's got people inside the city walls that are doing just as much harm or more harm than the enemies outside the walls. Nehemiah says, that's a shame. That should not be. And he's, he's very angry when he heard their cry and these words. So what does he do? Well, he consulted with himself. Don't look at me funny. There's a lot of you that consult with yourself a lot. How many of you have ever been driving down the road in a vehicle by yourself consulting with yourself about something? Yeah, I've seen you at stoplights, I'm pretty sure. If not you, it's other people that are consulting with themselves. You know, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of words that are used biblically of, of the concept of what we have here of consulting with himself. But I believe one of the principal words we could plug in here for the sake of our understanding is meditation. What meditation is, look... I'm sorry that Eastern religions have corrupted that idea 
But there is such thing as biblical meditation. It's not sitting on a grassy hill with your legs crossed and your, your, your hands shaped like circles or whatever and just kind of humming to yourself. I don't know what that is, but that's not what God had in mind by meditation. What meditation is, is when we allow our own intellect to process thoughts through the Word of God to come to a right understanding and a right thinking of how God wants us to think. That's what meditation is. And I got to tell you, as a child of God, we cannot do without meditation. We need meditation on, on a regular basis. Um, uh, let me just read to you a little bit from uh, Psalm 1. And you can read a little bit about what's involved in this concept of meditation. But the psalmist in Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So the psalmist says here, the child of God knows the Word of God, but then thinks according to the Word of God all throughout the day. As a child of God is going about through his day, he's processing all of the information that comes to him as to how it fits in line with the Word of God. And by doing that, there's some information you can throw away. And there's some information you can keep and apply and make you stronger and make you more like Christ and be better for it. But we do well to consult with ourselves about things before we just go and start making decisions. This, this, this concept of meditation is a necessary thing. Um, by the way, it's not wrong to consult with other people. The Bible talks about uh, wisdom being found in the multitude of counselors. And it's good to have godly, spiritually minded people that we trust in our life, that we can get counsel from, that we can bounce ideas off of. And, and that's a good thing. But let me remind you this. You don't have to have that in order to make godly, wise decisions. Let me remind you what John said in 1 John chapter 2. That you don't need for any man to teach you anything. You have an unction which is from the Holy One. As a child of God, you've got God's Holy Spirit living within you. And God living within you and having the Word of God as your guide, you have everything you need to, to be able to make right and godly decisions according to the wisdom which is from above. When the Bible here says that he consulted with himself, uh, I, I believe based upon what I know of Nehemiah that there's some prayer involved here. That's part of the meditatory uh, uh, process, the meditation process is, is to seek God. James also talked about that when he said this, if any man lack wisdom, hang on just a second, let me find out who I'm preaching to tonight. Any of us ever been there? All right, if you didn't raise your hand, you need to do some major, well, you need to consult with yourself. <laughs> you need to meditate on that a little bit. Let me help you. All of us lack wisdom every day. And James said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. God never rebukes a person for saying, God, I really need your wisdom on what to do here. God, I really need your counsel here. And, and, and the, the truth is, God doesn't say run to this counselor or this counselor or this counselor. Uh, God says, if you lack wisdom, ask of me. Ask of me. And uh, I'll hear your prayer. I'll give you wisdom. I won't upbraid you for doing that. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the billows of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So he, he, there he talks about surrender and submission to God's way being the only way. And, he, and so here's, here's Nehemiah. And I appreciate how many times he just shows a godly heart and a godly characteristic. So he's, the Bible says he consulted with himself. Slow to speak. 
If I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to talk about it with myself. That way I can do the least damage if what I say is wrong. Well, let, me, let me get a, a handle on what's going on here. But he was able to get a handle on it. He consulted with himself and he got clear vision on the matter and clear vision said, there's some obvious wrong that's being done here. And as the appointed authority that God and the king had placed there in the city of Jerusalem, then uh, Nehemiah comes forth as governor and he rebukes the nobles. Just kind of interesting that uh, back in Nehemiah chapter uh, 3, uh, when, the, when the workers are being listed, there's a group of men that, that he includes in here that did not work. And I just can't help but wonder if the, if the people that Nehemiah talked about that aren't doing the work, I, I wonder if they're the same ones taking advantage of the people. Can I park here for just a second? That oftentimes the ones who are contributing nothing are taking the most. I'm going to say it again. Sometimes it's the ones who are contributing the least that are taking the most. The Bible teaches us there's joy in being a contributor. There's joy in being a giver. There's joy in sacrifice. We're asked to, for every man to lay down his life a living sacrifice. And, and that's well-pleasing unto God. Uh, and, and we need to be a, a, a workman that not, needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we, we, need to be, we need to be workers. We need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because there's joy in being a contributor. But isn't it true in life that there's givers and there's takers? There's givers and there's, and there's takers. Oh, that God would help us to be givers. Uh, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 that there's going to be times in our lives and as we serve the king that we're going to be on both sides of that equation. There's going to be times when we get to give and there's going to be times when it's necessary that we take. And may we be humble enough to give when it's our turn to give and may we be humble enough to take when it's our turn to take. And the key here is, is humility. But there's some nobles here that are in the wrong and they're taking advantage of the people. And so Nehemiah says, I consulted with myself and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, Ye exact usury, that means um, um, very high interest on loans. Ye, uh, by the way, very high interest on loans, it usually has a specific intent, and that is to trap people in a debt situation. That's what high interest rates are designed to do. That, that's, not, that's not an accident that that's what title companies use payday loans use. Uh, they're not trying to be your friend and say, hey, uh, I'll, I'll cover you until you're back on your feet. What they're really hoping is that you never get back on your feet. And they're going to do their best to make sure you don't get back on your feet because they can continually use you and abuse you. And it's even sad to me that that's legal. But nonetheless, that's what they do. Credit card rates, 23, 25, 28%. Let me just tell you, I've counseled people in the church that have seen $20,000 become $60,000 in not much time. And then all of a sudden, by the time you're looking at those figures and those kind of rates, and then you have late fees that are tacked onto that, the, the design is this. You're never getting out of this. And so Nehemiah rebuked them and he said, Ye exact usury, every one of his, here's what made him so angry, his brother. You're doing this to your own family. 
This is truly one of those moments where Nehemiah is looking at people going, how do you sleep at night? How can you do this? You exact usury and you're doing this to your own brother. And I said, and then this is what he said he did next. He said, I set a great assembly against them. Now, now think about this. They're trying to get this wall built. They're trying to get this work done. But Nehemiah says, everybody stop. Stop what you're doing. Wait a minute. I thought we didn't ever stop on the wall. We can't afford to stop on the wall. We've got enemies out there. It's almost like Nehemiah was saying, until we deal with the enemies in here, the enemies out there don't really make much difference. Nehemiah says, we got to stop and let God's word build some walls in here. Set some standards in here. Build some boundaries in here so that these physical walls that we're building to protect us from an external enemy even matter. Because if you're destroyed from the inside, what's it matter what the enemy does on the outside? And we're going to see this as it, as it comes down to it in the next few verses. But let me also add this. Is it any wonder that the world treats God's people with the disdain that they do when they see how God's people treat one another sometimes? We, we can look at the world and get mad at the world for how they treat God's people, but the greater reproach and the greater shame is how God's people treat each other. And there's no excuse for it. And it's not right. Nehemiah says, well, we're going to deal with this. We might as well deal with it all together. Everybody come to the meeting. We've got the people that are taking advantage of, and we've got the people that are taking advantage, and we're going to get everybody together in one meeting. We're going to talk about it. So he gets everybody together. Verse number 8. And I said unto them. Now he's talking here to the nobles and the rulers. And, and he's talking to the whole assembly. But the, the meeting is for their benefit. <laughs> and he says, We after our ability have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren? Or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. So the first thing he does is he looks at the nobles and the rulers and he, he makes an appeal to their conscience. He says, look, do you not have any conscience about this? These Jewish people that live in this area, they were under Babylonian and Persian bondage and they have been set free and now they're being sold again, but who's selling them? Not, not the foreign powers, their own brethren. Have you no conscience? Does this not bother you? That the people that you are now merchandising in for your own benefit and for your own gain, those are the people that God set free from foreign bondage. And now they're not free. And the reason is because you are enslaving them. You are treating them like merchandise. So he appeals to their conscience. He appeals to their compassion. You don't have any compassion in this situation? How can you do this? Well, it's obvious that the message hit its mark. Because the Bible says, then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. They didn't give any justifications. They didn't, they didn't come back with some answer. And by the way, this is the proper response. This is the proper response. You see, Nehemiah listened to the matter. He, he uh, consulted with himself. And then when it was appropriate, he brought, he brought the rebuke. And praise God, these nobles listened to the matter, considered what was being told them, and didn't try to offer excuses. They held their peace. They had nothing to answer. But Nehemiah is not done. Verse 9, also I said, it is not good, uh, it, it is not good that ye do. This, this is not good what you're doing here. 
So now he appeals to morality. It's, it's as if he's saying, do you not understand? All of us were created in the image of God. And the fact that you are, that you are trading and merchandising your fellow brethren in this situation, this is not good that you do. This is not ethical. This is not moral. You are wrong for this. And then he goes on to say this, Ought ye not? Ought ye not? Now, now he's, a, he's, appearing, he's appealing to a moral compass. Isn't there a better way, he's saying? Isn't there a right way? that ye should be following? Isn't there something that you should be doing? Well, look, the answer to that we know because God wasn't silent on this matter. So the fact that God has spoken on this matter tells us that there's a way they ought to be living. And so Nehemiah is not just appealing to a moral compass here, but he's appealing to the word of God, and we're going to see that in just a second. But he says, ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God? Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God? You know what? This is too specific of language to be a coincidence when Nehemiah's talk, a coincidence when he's talking about this matter. It's too specific. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean that I believe in my heart that as Nehemiah is saying these words, the specific words that Nehemiah is using would bring certain scriptures from God's word to mind about this very subject. I want to show you what I'm talking about. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25 is the word that God spoke to Moses in Mount Sinai. And in particular, it's about what's called the year of Jubile or Jubilee. The Hebrew word there is Yalbel. Sounds better to say Jubilee in my opinion. The year of Yalbel just sounds weird to me. Leviticus chapter 25. He says in verse number 8, Leviticus 25, verse 8. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven, sab seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine, of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you, ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. You know what this means? God said, if somebody's mortgaged their land, then on the year, year of jubilee, then the person who now holds the deed returns that deed free of charge back to its owner. You get it back on the 50th year. So that's part, of the, that's part of the jubilee year. So he says, verse 14, and if, thou, uh, and if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy number. And according unto the number of years of the fruits, he shall sell unto thee. According to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price thereof. And according to the fewness of years, thou shalt diminish the price uh, thereof. By the way, what he's talking about here is prorating the prices and the cost of things based upon the year of Jubilee. Don't you think God's wise enough to look at humanity and, and, and see how people's minds are going to turn? And they're going to say, hey, uh, you know what, next year I get this back anyway. 
So I'm going to get a price that's, that takes advantage of this person who needs something over here, and then I get it back next year, and there's only one year's usage on it for whatever it is. And he knew that people would try to take advantage of the system. So God just takes 55 verses in this chapter to put every detail that needs to be in there to keep people from oppressing one another and taking advantage one, uh, of one another. So he says... Uh, Verse number 17, ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety, and the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. And if ye shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Because every seventh year they were supposed to not plant crops, let the land rest, and, and things like that. So uh, he says, if ye shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our, incre in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. That's a neat thing. That's a neat promise of God. God said, you do this my way. Watch what happens on the sixth year. I'll bless you threefold on the sixth year. On the sixth year, you'll have enough to eat on year six. You'll have enough to eat when you're not planting on year seven. And I don't know how many of you know this, but when you do start planting on year eight, it isn't like bread comes straight out of the ground. You got to wait for that to grow and you got to wait till harvest and then you got to wait to take it in and wait to make your flour. So there's actually another part of a year that left there. So here's what God said. He already had it taken care of. God said, I'm going to let the sixth year grow enough to cover you for year six, year seven, year eight. He's a good God, isn't he? And God says, I'll do that myself. I don't need y'all borrowing from one another. I don't need y'all oppressing one another. You just, you just do things my way and I'll bless it. That's what God says. Verse 22, and ye shall sow the eighth year and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruits come, and ye shall eat of the old store. The land shall not be sold forever. For the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxed and poor, now listen to this, because this is exactly the situation that we've got in Nehemiah. If thy brother be waxed and poor, and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the Jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return unto his possession. And if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year may he redeem it. And if it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever to him that bought it. Throughout his generations it shall not go out in the Jubilee. But the houses of the villages, which have no wall round about them, shall be counted as the fields of the country. They may be redeemed, and they shall go out in the Jubilee. Notwithstanding the cities of the Levites and the houses of the cities of their possession, may the Levites redeem at any time. So a little bit of special treatment there for the priests and the Levites there. And if a man purchase of the Levites, and there's more provisions that, that go on there. Verse 35, And if thy brother be waxen poor, and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, thou, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee, take thou no usury of him or increase. But watch what Nehemiah says here. But fear thy God. Now, these are specific things that God said about their situation. And then Nehemiah comes before these people who know the word of God. And he says, look, ought ye not to do differently? Ought ye not to live in such a way 
that fears God because God has a right way on this and it's the way that we ought to be going. And then Nehemiah finally says this. He says, because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies. So after all of these appeals, he makes one more appeal and he says this. He says, men, this doesn't look good. <laughs> this isn't a good testimony for the name of God. Th this isn't right, what we're doing. And Nehemiah, with good conscience, is able to say to the people, I'm trying to be a good example. This isn't something that he's just, he's, he's preaching to them, but he's not exercising himself. He says in verse 10, I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of you, uh, might exact of them, I'm sorry, money and corn. I pray you, let us leave off this usury. In other words, here's my plan for moving forward. Y'all ready for this? All of the interest rates are canceled today. That's what he says. Zero interest rates. We're going to cancel that. He says, men, you have the power to do that. That's, what I, that's my plan. Let's cancel the interest rates today. Then he says this, verse number 11. Restore, I pray you. Oh, I want to point this out. He doesn't demand that they do this. He appeals to them to do what's right. Even though he's the governor, even though he has authority, he appeals to them to do the right thing here. So he says, I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Verse 11, restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, their houses, also the hundredth part of the money and of the corn, the wine and the oil that ye exact of them. Then said they, we will restore them and will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. <laughs> Nehemiah says, then I called the priests and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. So, so Nehemiah says, here's what I suggest. I pray you, I suggest to you, I ask of you, why don't you do this? And they said, we'll do that. Nehemiah says, let's write that down. He's no dummy. He's not foolish. He, look, he knows that when somebody hears a good message, they can get on fire to respond until Monday. And then they can kind of forget what was preached on Sunday. So... Uh, Nehemiah says, hey, I, I'm just asking you men, let's do this. Let's cut the interest rates right now and let's restore the property back to the people. And they said, everything you said, we'll do that. He said, priests, come in here for a second. We're going to take an oath. Can I tell you something? This is bigger than a contract. This is more than a signature. This is more than the Old Testament custom of taking off your shoe and giving it to somebody or placing a hand under their thigh or whatever that was. He said, let's take an oath. In other words, it's this. God is my witness. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to respond. So, verse 13. So Nehemiah says, also, I shook my lap. What's that mean? Well, he's wearing a robe, and he's, I don't know if he's standing, but evidently he's either, he's either sitting like this or he's standing. I, I suppose since they're having this meeting, he's standing, but you're living in a climate. They're working on a wall. There's a lot of dust in this dirty environment. And so no doubt he's got some dirt on his, on his robe or on his cloak there. And so he takes his robe right here where, he, where, he's, where his lap would be and he shakes it. And of course there's dust and there's dirt, probably debris from wall building that morning that 
that falls off of his garments right there. And he says, he says, also I shook my lap and said, so God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise, even, uh, even thus be he shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, amen. And praise the Lord. And here's the good news. And the people did according to this promise. See, when do you think they did that? I think they did it that day. I think they repented that day. Sometimes we get scared of that word repentance. It's not a bad word. It just means we changed our mind. And therefore we changed our behavior. And their mindset was one way, and that caused a certain behavior. And when Nehemiah brought the word of God to their mindset, they said, you know what? God's right. We're wrong. We want to get in line with God's word, so here's what we're going to do. You no longer owe any interest on your payments. And furthermore, we're not going to hold the collateral against you. Now, it doesn't say anything about relieving the debt. Apparently, there were payments that people still needed to make to the people that loaned them money. And let me just tell you, it is right to pay back your debts. I want to say it again. It is right to pay back your debts. It is dishonest to take out loans without intention of paying them back or to take out loans and then trust others or the government to pay that off for you. It is wrong to take out debt and plan on going into default over that debt. You say, preacher, why are you making an issue out of this? Anybody remember 2008 in the United States of America? The housing market crash followed subsequently by the stock market crash. And, and I'm telling you, it, maybe it didn't affect you, but there were people that were greatly affected. There were people in our church who had retirement sitting in 401ks in 2008 that they were dependent on for their, for their latter non-productive and non-working years uh, of their life. And all of a sudden, these 401ks went from enough money to sustain them for the rest of their days to not enough to make it through the next year or two. I, I'm talking about serious things. And I don't know, you know how much I love history, but I don't just love history way back. I kind of like to know history that just happened yesterday because we can learn from it. Do you know why the housing market collapsed in 2008? Because the greed of substandard lenders loaned money that didn't exist to people who never had any means or intentions of paying it back. And they were called subprime loans. And subprime loans were simply, uh, well, you, you're starting to see the signs again today. No credit check, no down payment, no money, no problem. I'm sorry, but in the right kind of business, there's a problem. If you don't, if you don't have the money, uh, if, you're not, if you don't have a means of paying me back, then this loan cannot sustain. And that's exactly what happened. And through these subprime loans, lenders on the secondary market loaned out money to people who did not have credit scores that could validate for the fact that they had uh, financial business sense and accountability for their spending. Uh, they did not have uh, job support to show they were making enough income to pay these loans. And there were people that testified in 2008 into 2009 that they, they signed up for and got these loans with this mentality. You ready for this? With this mentality. That, that if they never paid a payment, at least they could stay in a nice place for seven to nine months. It caused the crash of the housing market. 
And because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were viewed as the most solid places in the stock market uh, for the safekeeping of people's assets, it took the market down with them and all of that was because of the greed of lenders and the inability to pay of borrowers. And I'm just going to tell you, yes, the lenders were wrong, but it is equally young, it is equally wrong to borrow beyond your means. Romans 13 even says, oh, no man, anything. It's a dangerous practice to getting into, getting into owing people. And, and, and yet the circumstances here brought the people to a necessity, but that necessity was taken advantage of uh, by, by greedy, self-serving people. But I'm happy to tell you that when the word of God was introduced to the situation by the man of God, then the people that were greedy said, you know what, there's a simple fix for this. We let go of our greed and we restore people a means to be able to get out of this situation. And you know what? It worked. Imagine that. God's way works. <laughs> oh, that we would just always be interesting, interested in knowing what is God's way and following through. Because it really does work. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless your word tonight. And Lord, we thank you tonight.